Okay, let's go to God in a word of prayer. We'll go ahead and get started. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Father, for the freedom we have in the country we live in to be able to gather in this way. That we're not stopped, Father, by, by uh, a government that, that is not approving of people studying your word. That we live in a country that is, is, is willing to allow various beliefs, Father. And we ask you, Father, to please help us to realize what opportunity that gives us and never to, uh, and never to neglect or take for granted that opportunity, but to use it, Father, for your glory. We love you. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Ah, good morning, Robert. Good to have you. Okay, the study today on a word that uh, I jokingly said is a commonly used word in our language, which it's not. <laughs> we're using the word, we're going to be studying the word propitiation today. Now, in studying that word propitiation, understand something. Just like it's not a commonly used word in our, in our society, it's also not a commonly used word in the Bible. Morning, Sherry. It's not a commonly used word in the Bible either. It's only used here in the, in, in, in the entire Bible, here in 1 John. And it's, it's here in this verse we're studying, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And it's in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And so we are going to look at, first off, what the word propitiation means. And secondly, we're going to look at how it is it fits into those two verses that are used within God's word and what, what it should be showing us, okay? Now, when we think of God, especially, hey, especially, let's stay with 1 John, especially because this is how most people think of God. In 1 John, we are told that God is love, all right? We see that, we see that uh, common idea, well, I think it's in, all, in verse 2 through 4, chapters 2 through 4, especially in verse 4. He, uh, it's mentioned the idea of God being love because that, for that reason, we ought to be loving towards our fellow man, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we should be loving because God is loving. All right. That is a, that is a very uh, popular idea within the world. The idea of God's love is something that over that overpasses everything else in people's minds about God. And I don't want to take away from the idea of recognizing that God is love. But because people tend to focus on that fact, which it is a fact, God is love, God is loving, uh, for God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only begotten son, all of those things about God people that people appreciate that he's loving uh, they try to overshadow his love with every other thing, every other uh, emotion, every other uh, fact about God. God is love most certainly, but that doesn't mean that his love overshadows, for instance, his idea of justice. All right, uh, God is a just God. What that means is he is going to do the right thing even when that comes down to, for instance, punishment. God's love doesn't keep him from punishing. Good morning, Janet. Good to see you. God's love doesn't keep him from punishing sinners. Now, I started to quote that one verse everyone knows real well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, that verse makes it clear that God's love drove him to desire Jesus to be a sacrifice because he loved the world so much, he allowed his son to die. Why? Because God is just. Okay? The, the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. There needed to be a death. So in that respect right there, his love did not overshadow his justice. God didn't just say, oh, never mind anyway. Everyone, you're all forgiven. All right? God didn't do that. Well, why not? He's loving. Uh, yeah, but his loving, his being loving does not overshadow his justice. Okay? God describes himself in, uh, in Exodus chapter 20. 
God describes himself as a jealous God. Now, normally when we think of the word jealous, morning, Edie. Normally when we, we think of the word jealous, we think of the bad characteristics of jealousy, okay? Uh, someone who is, is threatening because they're jealous or, or hurtful of, of their loved one because they are jealous and they feel as if they are, as if they are being, um, uh, play, uh, 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 their loved one is playing around or whatever you, however you want to say that. But, but the idea of that kind of jealousy. See, this, this is the wonderful thing about God. God is love. Also, 1 John says, God is light, in him is no darkness. So God's reactions to someone when he is jealous, and then, by the way, in that context, he's jealous of people, of the Jews at that time, Ten Commandments he's speaking, uh, that they not worship other gods, that they not make idols and fall down and worship them. Why? Because I am a jealous God. That's what, that's what God says there in Exodus chapter 20 doesn't want them worshiping idols. That worship belongs to him. But God does not fly off the handle. God is not going to react, overreact in a situation. But God's also not going to underreact. That's an important point to note. He's not going to underreact in a given situation. Now, why am I given all this prelude to look at this word propitiation? All right. Well, here's the reason. The word propitiation gives the idea of, of our sins being atoned for, our sins being, uh, the guilt of our sins being removed. But what it also gives the idea of is the wrath of God being removed. Okay? Sin angers God. Now, as I said a few moments ago, it, it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that God's going to fly off the handle. God doesn't fly off the handle. God makes decisions about what he's going to do, including, including within himself his reaction as a God of love, but including within himself his, his reaction as a God who is just, who does the right thing. Remember this verse right here? It's at the end of Romans chapter 12. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will avenge. All right. Well, why? And by the way, he says it there at the end of Romans chapter 12, when he tells people not to take vengeance. Well, when I take vengeance, I'm not just going to get you back. I'm going to do you one over. Okay. You're going to wish you never mess with me. And that's the normal attitude that a human has to try to figure out how to make certain you feel sorry that you did what you did and you, you're you never going to do it again because of the way I react. All right, that, that's, a, that's a societal idea. Well, God doesn't react that way. God, his vengeance is right, righteous, because God is righteous. He takes his vengeance and he takes it seriously, but he doesn't go beyond what needs to be done. So, let me give you an example from the Old Testament. Turn, turn with me for a moment all the way back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 12 and 13 is what I, is what I want. This is, where, this is where Moses, where Israel provokes God. Moses had been up on the mountain receiving the, receiving the tablets, the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on them. You see that, you see that in verse 11. Okay, of, of Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 11. In fact, let me read 11, 11 with those two verses. So I'm going to start with verse 11. I want us to read 12 and 13. And then I want us to read down a little bit past 12 and 13. And look what God is doing. Israel has sinned. They, had, they have worshipped the golden calves. Okay, look at what it says. While Moses was up on a mountain receiving the, receiving the law. Verse 11. It came about at the end of 40 days and nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Now Moses is re re recounting to the Israelites what had occurred. Good morning, Terry. Good to have you with us. And, and Wassam, good to see you. So, verse 12. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down from here quickly, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them, and they have made a molten image 
for themselves. I think I earlier I said two calves. I was thinking of of uh, of uh, of a uh, later king of Israel, but there's only one calf, but big deal. All right. Um, they have quickly turned aside from the way I commanded them. They have made a molten image for themselves. Verse 13, the Lord said, spoke further to me saying, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stubborn people. <coughs> so, so look out, look at, look at God's words there. Sound angry? Well, Look at what he goes on to say. Verse 14. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven that and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So God is saying, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy all of Israel and make a nation out of you. Just like he told Abraham, I, he was going to make a nation out of him. Great na nations would come from Abraham. Well, he was going to make the, uh, the Jewish nation through through Moses. Now keep going with me. Why, why are you doing, wanting to do that, God? Look at verse 15. So I turned and came down from the mountain, this is Moses speaking, while the mountain was burning with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands, and I saw that you had indeed sinned against the Lord God, your God. You had made for yourself a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. I took hold of the two tablets and threw them from my hands and smashed them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at, as at the first forty days and nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you had committed in doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Verse 19, For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure which with which the Lord had wrathful against you in order to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. The Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him, so I prayed for Aaron at the same time. I took your sinful thing, the calf, and he's going to go on and talk about what he did with the golden calf. All right, melted it down, threw it in, uh, threw it in water, uh, you know, burned it up, threw it in water, and made them drink the water. Okay, you can keep going and seeing what happens. But notice the reason that Moses says it was going on. Good morning, Aunt Mary. Good to see you. The reason it was going on was God was angry. All right. Now, again, don't get caught up in how we oftentimes think of someone who's angry. They're out of control. God doesn't get out of control. God makes his decisions with emotion, but also logically at the same time, something we humans have a hard time doing. God is just. The fact that God is just. I mentioned a few moments ago, the fact that God is love means that doesn't keep him from from doing, from 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 doing, uh, from punishing, it doesn't keep him from punishing. But the fact that God is just keeps him from overreacting. God is not going to overreact towards an towards a sin that was committed. They had committed a sin. Remember what the wages of sin is? Death. death. Yeah, exactly. Death. The wages of sin is death. So would God have been just? To give them what they had earned? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. God would have been just to give them what they earned. They earned death. So, if God is just and they earned death, they didn't die. Who paid the price? Go with me back to 1 John chapter 2. And this is a true statement for every sin that has ever been committed. Who paid the price? All right. In 1 John chapter 2, start with verse 1 and read into, let's just read 1 and 2. That's all we need. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That idea of advocate is someone who speaks for us to God. Okay. Like a lawyer who speaks to the court for the one he defends, okay? Keep going. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for those of the whole world. He's the propitiation of our sins. It's because of him God's wrath has been removed, okay? It's because of him our guilt has been removed, all right? God was angry. 
God was angry over our sins, not an anger that's going to be out of control, an anger that's going to be it's going to be fulfilled. It's an anger that's going to see satisfaction. It's an anger because he's a just God. The right thing is going to be done. So what needed to happen? Death. Who died? No, Jesus did. Jesus, the one who had never sinned, okay? So he was the perfect one to take on the sins of the world because he didn't have to take on sins of his own first. He didn't have that. Hey, Albert? Yes, ma'am. Um, in my looking into the word propitiary, uh, propitiation, I found out that the mercy seat in the Old Testament was also called the propitiary seat. Propitiary seat. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh wow. Is it is it called that in the Bible or is that just uh, no? Oh. It's just another name for it. Um, okay. I need to do some more research into that. Thank I you. didn't have time, but I thought that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, when you, you have the wrath of God mm -hmm. and um, maybe when someone's angry with you, you can beg for mercy. You know yeah. that mercy seat. Mercy seat. And, yeah. and Jesus took His own blood and applied it to the true mercy seat in heaven. You know, mm -hmm. In a way, that was maybe how that propitiation came about, you know. Right. The act right. of his high priest duties. Right. Very, very good. Very good. And so, yeah. So, yeah. That, and, and, of course, that's a shadow of what we have in the new covenant with Jesus Christ. Right. Now, understand something. There's people in the world who believe that God just made up this plan with Jesus Christ, and he could have done it any way he wanted to. And that just not that just is not accurate. When God said the wages of sin is death, when God told Adam and Eve, "You eat of that trot that tree and you will die," spiritually they did die. Well, they had to be spiritually resurrected. Death had to be given for the sin that they had committed. Death had to be given for the sins we've all committed. And again, Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, who never sinned was the perfect one to take on the sins of the world. He paid for the sins of all, and God accepted his death as taking away his anger and as taking away our guilt. And that's what that word propitiation means. Jesus Christ was horribly beaten before he was put on the cross. He was spit upon. He was, I mean, when I say beaten, I'm talking about that, 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 that beating with the whip that would that could take your life all by itself. Cat you know? of nine tails. Yeah, cat of nine tails. It had the, glass and hooks on it, and the yeah. intent was to disembowel the person who was being whipped. Right, right. God allowed that. God allowed his anger to be taken out on Jesus Christ. Man did it. Please understand something. God did not beat him. God allowed him to be beat. Okay. A lot of people ask that question. Why did God allow this to happen or that to happen? Then, you know, this child, uh, and then we oftentimes sit and we try to figure out God's mind on, on why he allowed it, because, you know, however you want to think about that. But we can understand exactly why God allowed this to happen to Jesus Christ. Good morning, Christopher. We can understand totally why God allowed this to be done to Jesus Christ. God allowed it to be done because his anger needed to be fulfilled. Because he is a just God, because he is a loving God, he did not allow things to go too far with Jesus Christ, but he allowed things to go exactly how far they needed to go. That doesn't, that, by the way, that doesn't take away the sin of the, of the Romans who did it, or the Jews who sent him, who, who cried out, crucify him, but God's anger over sin needed to be fulfilled. And, and, and just because man was going to commit sin doesn't, 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 uh, doesn't allow for that sin, but God allowed it to happen. All right. So, so when we think about it, if you've ever seen the passion of Christ, which I never have, I didn't want to see it. When people told me, when people told me what, what, it, what it was like, I was like, I already know what it's like. I've, I've studied about what crucifixion is. And I just don't have the guts to watch it. Okay, I, I, I'll fully admit that. I don't want to see that. I wouldn't have wanted to been there and, and see see it literally. If I had a time machine and go back, I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't want to see that. I know what happens with crucifixion and everything going up to it. So I don't want to see that. 
But but it, it, for those of you who have seen it, now you've got an idea of God's wrath needing to be needing to be fulfilled. Now, let me show you. Well, we could go back and we could look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We could go back and we could look at the flood. Think about the flood. A whole world of people drowned to death or whatever other mudslides, whatever you want to talk about happened and how they died. They died. Why? Because God was angry. Genesis chapter 6 says he was sorry that he had made man. He repented of the fact that he had made man. And, and therefore, he was going to destroy us all. Then Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was someone that God saw he could work with. He would work with. Morning, Noah. Good to see you. <laughs> I just said Noah. Noah found grace in God. And Noah Rick just showed up. Good to see you. Good to see you, Noah. But, but you know, so God's anger was being, was being played out in that time. Again, please understand something. When you think of angry and you think of someone who's out of control, that's not God. But the right thing is done. God is love, most certainly. God is jealous, most certainly. God is just, most certainly. He has lots of different hats. He wears all at the same time. They all belong to him. Okay? Go with me now to Romans chapter chapter 1. Definitely make certain you let me know when it's 10 minutes, honey, because... <laughs> I got one more verse I want to look at in the in the area of it. Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1, verses, verses 18 through 20. Look at what it starts off with. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because they, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what, through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Let me break it down real simple. That's a great study, and one of these days maybe we'll do a study of the latter part of Romans 1 because it really relates for our day-to-day. -day. But let me just break it down real simple. Man knows there's a God. They know it because of what they look around and see. The fact that there's a God, there must be one. But men are ignoring that fact. They're coming up with all sorts of other reasons for, the, for, for everything that's around, reasons that just don't make sense. All right, Where did everything come from? Well, it just was. That doesn't make sense between the first and second laws of thermodynamics. But anyway, I don't want to digress into that. But, but it doesn't make sense. So there has to be a God. And the, and the fact that they, they know there is a God, they're just ignoring the fact, makes God angry. And it says there, it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. There in verse 18. Now it's going to go on and talk about talk about God allowed them to go deeper into sin. I mean, he not made them. That's the direction they were wanting to go. He allowed it to happen. And, and, and gets all the way down to verse 32. Look at verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Need to be careful there, don't we? Yes. It's a warning for us. And again, it connects with verse 21, for even though they knew God. Yes. You know, so there's you know, there's a message for us in these verses. And and, and it shows God's righteous anger. Uh -huh. They know there's a God. They know that what they're doing is wrong. They know that they deserve death. They know it, they know it, they know it, but they not only do it, but they approve of those who do. Does God have a right to be angry? Yeah. We I mean, should be angry with that righteous anger. Yes, yes, we too should be angry. Now, we got to be careful with our anger, because sometimes right. our anger, James chapter 1, the anger of man does not always go towards righteousness. Now, let me read that. Let me read that. I, that's a good point, Julian, and I, and I want to make that point because it, it's in contrast to God. Look at what it says in, in uh, verse uh, 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 book. James 1. James 1. 
Oh, it's on down. I'm looking too early. There it is. Verse 20. Verse 19 and 20. James 1, 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Why? For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. We get angry, we fly off the handle. We get angry, we're going to do one up. We get angry, we're going to show you. You know, God gets angry and he does the right thing. The right thing, the wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus had to die. Go back to John, 1 John chapter 2. That's why Jesus had to die, because man deserved death. Good morning, Sheila. Now, keep it in context. Look at what he just said in verse 2 about Jesus, the one who God inflicted his anger upon because of our sin. Look at what it says in verse 1. Um, and we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the one who God inflicted with anger. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is vengeful? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ loves us? We're the reason he went through that. He's our advocate. Doesn't sound to me like I have one that is very, is, is going to be very, uh, um, is going to keep his emotions out of it. Well, yes, we do. No. Hebrews teach us that, that he was tempted in every way. And without sin, but he's also compassionate upon us because he's been there. He knows what it is to yes. have these thoughts like a man. Exactly. Tempted like us, yet without sin. So he's the perfect high priest. And he is he is God, and he is love, and he is just. He is. And he recognized that he paid the price. And so he's our advocate. And so when we have come to God and accepted his gospel as our advocate, Jesus Christ is saying after the list of charges is raised against us his advocate is saying yep but they're all been paid i paid for it remember you took your, your wrath out on me because he doesn't have Albert, to god remembers of course yes ma'am i looked it up yesterday and, and the definition just out of the dictionary for this word was atonement yes the idea that something needs to be atoned for has to be has to be made up for exactly Ten minutes. 10 minutes thank you exactly pat so what needs to be atoned is our sin. And, and in doing that, everything involved with our sin has to be taken care of. Our guilt has to be taken care of. God's wrath has to be taken care of. Okay? So you're absolutely right. The idea of atonement is a good... Now you got to look up the word atonement because we don't use that one all the time, do we? But, you know, he atoned, he atoned for his crimes. We'll use that a lot of times with prisoners. He paid for them. Okay, Jesus Christ paid for our crimes. God's wrath was taken care of. Our guilt was taken care of. Now, go to chapter 4, verse 10. The other, the only other use of the word in the entire Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. I'm going to start with verse, verse 7. I love this because here is our God is love idea uh, from, from the word. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for manifested in us that God has sent John. His that John. God John. has. Connections going out. I'm sorry. What? One John, all the way in the back. You say my connection's gone out? What? Julie, what'd you Albert? say? Yes. My connection. Ah, okay. It looks like we're back on here at least. Uh, ho okay. Let me uh, let me see if I can get the other fired up. Those of you on those of you on uh, Facebook, let's see if we can let's see what we can do about the other. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish what I my thought here in in First John chapter four. I'm going to start again in verse seven. Okay, First John chapter four verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. All right, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now again, I like the fact that this is connected. 
Look at what he goes on to say. God is love. By this, verse 9, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Now look at God's love being manifested. Now Jesus was his only begotten son, his beloved son, but his love for us was so great that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die. He says it in a very nice way that we might live. Well, we live because he died. Now look at the very next verse. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So that discussion we had about propitiation a little bit earlier, remember what it means. It means to, it means to remove the wrath, okay? Removal of wrath and removal of guilt. His wrath was taken away because it was applied to his son. That is what we're seeing within within first John chapter chapter two. We saw it there, but here in chapter five, we see it here. His love was shown in the giving of his son for our sins. All right. So that word propitiation is a very good and appropriate word for us today. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an appropriate word for what Jesus Christ did. It's an appropriate word for us to recognize what needed to be taken care of with God. It shows how much God loves us. It shows how much God loves and how much God is just. The word is a beautiful word for making up for what mankind has misunderstood about Jesus, about God, and his love. It shows us God is everything that God is. He is love, but he is just. He is jealous, but he is kind. He is, he is a God of peace, but he will fight war when we go to war against him, James chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 5, okay? Um, we, God is all those things. The problem comes is when we want to limit him to just one. There's people out there who like to limit God to his, to his justice and not even think about his love. They, they, they act like God is some kind of evil God that it just can't wait to throw us into hell. No, that's not true. But the opposite is not true. That God is only love, and his love is, over, is going to overwhelm his justice, and therefore he's not going to do the just thing. No, that's not true either. God is going to do the right thing, the righteous thing. It's going, what he does is going to be correct. There is, no, there is no saying, wow, you went too far. No, he won't go too far. God is going to do the right thing. That's why Jesus needed to be our propitiation. It wasn't just a plan that anything else could have worked if God deemed it to work. No, it's what needed to happen so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. Let's go to God in a word of prayer and we'll be closed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, Father, for what you are willing to do what you are willing to do to your son because of your love for us. Help us, Father, to always appreciate that. Help us, Father, to, for that reason, live for you. You are our creator, but you are our savior, Father. And one day, if we are not right with you, you will be our judge. You will judge us even if we're right with you, but we have no fear of that judgment because Jesus Christ took the punishment. Help people, Father, to recognize that you want us to be beyond your wrath. You want us to be with you for eternity. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all very much.